Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session about building a successful open source community as an end user company. Uh, my name is Henrik Flix. I'm a principal product manager at Intuit with a long history in open source, starting in the mid 90s with uh, Linux. Uh, I was a stacker for a number of years, and now lately I've been focusing on Kubernetes and Argo here at Intuit. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina Hirani. I am a software engineer at Intuit. I work on the Argo rollouts team, which is responsible for progressive delivery of applications in Kubernetes. I've been part of the open source community for the last year and a half. I've been a software engineer for about four years and I'm really enjoying my experience um, in the open source community. So uh, just a little background on, on who we are. Uh, I think for those of you that are from the US, you might have heard about us, uh, but we're a US-based uh, FinTech company, started almost 40 years ago. Uh, and as of, as of uh, uh, this, this early this year, basically 95% of our revenue is coming from activities in the United States. And you probably heard about our project uh, products called, uh, called TurboTax and the personal finance app Mint, as well as our small business uh, program around QuickBooks. Uh, we have uh, about $10 billion in revenue from our over 60 million customers uh, that runs on, on our platform. Uh, and we've uh, taken this fintech company on a very interesting journey over the last few years where we, had very, we were a very traditional company running in data centers, uh, a lot of you know, traditional applications, traditional architecture to now lately a fully cloud native running a public cloud uh, platform using cutting edge technologies, you know, using Argo, Kubernetes, Service Mesh, uh, Serverless, uh, and so on. And in, during this journey, we've also invested a lot in, in open source. Uh, we have over 75 open source projects on GitHub, uh, and we're also a CNCF uh, gold, gold member. Uh, so just a quick recap for those of you that don't know Argo. Uh, so Argo is really a, a set of four different cloud native projects. We're currently in uh, CNCF incubator project since uh, April last year. And we have two projects that are more geared towards uh, GitOps uh, with Argo CD, allowing you to do GitOps with Git as the source of truth for your application and infrastructure. And then we have Argo rollouts, which uh, enable progressive delivery with advanced deployment strategies for application rollouts, like uh, blue-green and canary strategies. And then we have two projects uh, that are on more on the ML side. We have Argo Workflows, which is a Swiss army knife of a workflow engine that can be used for things like massive job parallelization and automation. Uh, and it's currently used with, uh, throughout our user base and within Intuit for ML data pipelines and various infrastructure uh, automation. And then we have Argo Events, which is an event-driven framework to help you trigger actions when various events occur in external event sources. Very commonly used together with workflows to trigger a workflow when, when something happens. Uh, and just a proof point on how far we have come and, and where we are today with, with our Argo projects. We currently have uh, over 18,000 stars, which is almost uh, uh, doubling since almost a doubling since uh, we incubated uh, a little bit over a year ago. We were getting close to 4,000 contributors that are helping out the project in various ways. Uh, and almost a thousand of those 4,000 are actually contributing code to one of the four, four sub projects. Uh, and we've had a very steady growth, uh, very linear growth for all our four projects. And we're growing at a rate between 20 to 30 stars a day, you can see the Argo CD and Argo workflow are growing a little faster than, than events and, and rollouts, but all four projects have a ni very nice, healthy, continuous, steady growth. Uh, and quickly about the timeline, how these four projects came to be and how Argo came to be all together. Uh, they were incubated at a startup called Aplatics a little bit over four years ago. And as part of the transformation, the platform transformation, the mandate, uh, mentioned earlier, when that started Intuit was acquired by, by sorry, Aplatix was acquired by Intuit to help through this transition. Uh, Argo Workflows was currently there with Aplatix. As that team started 
getting heads down in building this new platform for Intuit, uh, the need for something uh, to manage application and, and the delivery of application was, was born. And that's where Argo CD uh, came out. Um, a little bit later that same year, uh, we had one of our users, BlackRock, that'd be using Workflow for a long time, contribute to Argo events. Uh, and that you know made a, a trio of projects. After Argo CD was put in production and into it, there were additional requirements and learnings uh, that led to the, you know, to the understanding and development of, of Argo rollouts. We needed something that could do uh, progressive delivery and these advanced deployment strategies, but we didn't want to build that into one of the existing projects because we want to keep them, keep them separate. And I'll talk more about it in a little bit and keeping them modular and more as building blocks. So hence, you know, Argo rollouts came out of, came out of that. Uh, and lately we've been focusing more on you know, polishing and, and getting Argo as a project mature. You know, the features are there, the products are there, but we also wanna make sure that the project itself in terms of governance and maturity is there. So like I said, we've incubated uh, with CNCF, we're currently working uh, towards graduation. And as part of this process, we've, we've gone through you know, a number of, of steps to, to uh, standardize our governance, membership responsibilities and things like that. So we're, we're really excited going through the process and hoping to graduate um, the projects here later this year. So some benefits of open source that we believe are that it helps build better software. And we believe that because you have a large community involved with your project, which means lots of different peer reviews, uh, a big variety of ideas and contributions. And because the code is completely open to the public, we believe this demands a higher standard of code and also of professionalism uh, because contributors take more pride in, they were, in their work. They realize that everyone can see everything. Um, it, it's a point of pride for them. And another great thing about open source is that we believe it attracts and retains talent. So open source projects are known for being new and exciting, using all kinds of uh, cutting edge technologies. And there's also a pipeline from being an open source contributor to possibly getting hired by the company who runs the open source project if you contribute frequently enough and provide things like large features and stay in contact with the group maintaining the project. So um, engineers can definitely get a lot of experience working in the project and they can also get um, a lot of recognition as well as uh, the ability to work with multiple different organizations the ability to be exposed to a variety of contributors outside of their company, and a lot of great perks like open source events, um, attending conferences like KubeCon, going to all kinds of different meetups. So it's a very fun environment, and we find that talented engineers do want to work in open source. And um, another benefit that we believe is that open source allows companies to establish a technology brand. So open source projects cannot subsist on marketing magic because the technology is completely public to the world. Um, this helps to build trust with consumers because there are no secrets in the code and um, because anyone can view and use the technology you put out, they can tell that it actually works. So it can improve the reputation of the company. So when you have a project and you are deciding whether to open source it or not, there are a few questions you need to ask yourself. Um, the first is, is what you're doing going to provide value to the broad community? So are you solving a problem that many other people have? Um, or is it something very specific to your company and your situation? People won't be inclined to work on or adopt a project that doesn't fit their requirements. So if your project has very narrow use cases, it is unlikely to build a following. Uh, another thing to consider is the time and commitment. Open source is a lot of work to maintain and you need to put a lot of time and effort into building and sustaining a community. So you have to consider, do you have the backing time and resources to make the project successful? 
Um, we'll cover in later slides just how much work it takes um, to maintain an open source project and what you need to do. But the important thing to know is that, um, you know, if you're an individual who has an open source project, it's important to have approval and backing from your managers. So you have the time and resources to work on it full time. And if you're a company um, considering having an open source project, then you need to allocate funding to hire engineers full time. And you need to commit to providing resources, even though uh, it can be easier to get funding for vendors with business plans. So another thing to consider is, do you have an actual goal or plan with your project or your idea? So um, is it a short-term goal, um, like a Kubernetes migration, or is it a longer-term goal? Um, it's also important to consider, you know, is it a specific problem with the company or um, is it a problem that many people face and therefore it would benefit everyone to get the community involved? So um, we believe that with short-term projects like migration, once the migration is over, um, the project could eventually become obsolete. It's important to uh, invest in a long-term project. So something like Argo, for example, um, we have um, sub projects that deal with continuous deployment and progressive delivery. And those things will always be in need. So it will never really become obsolete at any point. So um, the last thing you need to consider is, uh, will your project actually benefit from community engagement? Um, if it is very specific to your company, then it may not be worth open sourcing because it won't benefit very much from community interaction. So maybe it's better to keep your project simple and not worry about the community's variety of use cases and keep it very specific to your um, specific company use cases instead in that case. So um, what makes a project good for open sourcing? Um, one is that it solves a very specific problem uh, in a unique way. And what's important is that it relieves a problem that is unaddressed with no current solution available. So that will benefit the broader ecosystem. That means that your project is not competing with existing solutions, um, which could involve a lot of uh, politics and unnecessarily competitiveness. And the community can rally behind you instead of thinking which project they should choose. Um, another important factor is something modularized and something that can be used and integrated easily. So um, if you have a very big project with complex use cases, that introduces a lot of dependencies on other technologies and other open source projects, which make it tough to maintain. Um, so if it's modular, uh, so, um, you know, it's important that uh, if it's modularized, then components of your project can be easily used by other open source projects. So um, in Argo, for example, we intentionally built it so that there are these different building blocks like CD, continuous deployment, progressive delivery, um, workflows for orchestration, because they are easy to integrate um, as one of the many tools that people use. So we also think that mature internal projects are very good projects to open source because you know it works in production, your company is already using it, it has a lot of active internal users, um, there's an existing rigor in releases, patching, updating. Um, so for Argo CD and rollouts, we created it because we believe it's necessary to Intuit's modern SaaS platform. And one big reason it's successful is because we have a strong commitment to innovate and improve it because we also use it and depend on it. So from a maintainer's point of view, here are some benefits of being part of the open source community. Um, being part of the community can be great. They are very generous. They help a lot with bouncing ideas around, they provide features, they provide bug fixes, and they're very passionate about being involved in various open source projects. Um, they also provide all kinds of fresh ideas and use cases because they come from such different fields that it helps solidify the project's utility across um, a lot of different types of uses. So, um, you know, it's really rewarding and fun to be part of a community for as someone who works in open source. Um, it's great to, you know, have 
work on something with followers and fans. Um, and it, it's great to know that so many people are passionate about what you work on and that you, they actually use it. Um, and external users and open source tend to be very experimental. Um, they tend to be um, more intrinsically motivated. They're not you know, just working on it for money. They're working on it um, to benefit themselves and the community, which is great. So um, in contrast, some challenges of having an open source project is that passion does not necessarily mean that contributors create usable code. Um, you have to have very careful guidelines for contributions to make sure they meet things like testing requirements, code coverage requirements, um, make sure they create issues and green light features with you first before they um, before they provide a PR with lots of code that you are not able to approve because it doesn't fit in the roadmap. So um, you need to be very careful about um, making it clear how people should go about contributing. And one issue is that contributors are not obligated um, to help maintain the project long term. Um, a lot of contributors are very passionate, very um, great to have involved in the community, but um, they are not financially obligated. It's not part of their job to continue to be involved in the project. And if they contribute a feature that maybe they no longer maintain when they have a different job or their life circumstances change, then that can create a problem for you as the maintainer. Um, and with internal development, um, it's structured, it's reliable um, in contrast to the community, which does not necessarily have the obligation as a bunch of coworkers who work at the same company. So it's always a little bit of a risk. So one thing that's really important in open source project and, and, and Karina touched on that earlier is defining what your goals and, and what the success for your project means. Like what's, what's the end goal uh, of the project? Uh, and in, instead of just saying it, it's just gonna be a can and forever continuing project is really important to set up a goal so you can say you know or at least milestone saying you know we've reached these point in terms of maturity adoption or whatever it might be uh, it might be a, a goal for the company itself using this as part of the tech branding that we said earlier uh, going through a transformation making sure that you build awareness in the community uh, and use that to attract talent and then just build a better reputation for your company. I mean, that might be a goal and you can use something quantifiable like uh, the number of talent you attract, for example, as part of the tech, the tech brand. It can also be uh, solving a specific problem. Uh, we know, or you know that you have something that needs to be resolved internally uh, and there is a project where those use cases uh, fit in very well. So you start engaging with that project or start a new project to solve those specific features. Uh, once those features are done, then you know, maybe put the project in maintenance mode, uh, or if, if you're part of a bigger project, then maybe you know, start working on a different part of that project or, or move on to a different project. But at least have a goal of, this is the amount of work we need to complete to solve these use cases or solve these problems. And that will also help you know, justify internally why you're engaging with with that project or starting a new new project. Uh, can also be something if you're coming more from the vendor side and, and using uh, and looking at uh, some of the quantifiable metrics like the number of stars you know that I showed that I showed earlier or um, the number of users that are adopting it adopting it in production and using that as a means to to gain momentum for an open source project that maybe you are or will base an enterprise uh, offering on at, at some point. Or it could also be you know, something that our management really likes, uh, like cost savings uh, and driving internal adoption of open source. Uh, and in, in, the, in a, a step of doing that adoption of that open source internally, you might need to add a feature here or there, but by, by doing that investment in open source, you can take a project, use it in your data center, public cloud, whatever, and, and have cost savings uh, you know, the, to, to justify, to justify that, that investment. But then again, you have, you have a goal, you have something measurable. This is what we're, why we're investing. It's gonna give us these benefits. They're gonna give us this value. Uh, 
uh, you know, you can take that to to the, you know, the board management, your boss, whatever it is that, that signs the check uh, and, and show some something quantifiable. Uh, getting the project of the off the ground uh, and, and Karina uh, talked about that a little bit earlier, but some of the key things that we've seen that we've learned along the way, uh, one of the most important one is keeping things simple. Uh, being able for a user to be able to start using it basically right away. Having quick start guides, easy to follow documentation, a, a way to, to install it and start using it right away. Uh, and I, you say like, might, you might have five minutes to get the user on board and running. If it takes longer than five minutes, but they have a question, then it goes into the next, the next uh, bullet here about user community support. If they fail to get started themselves within five minutes, you have one, maybe two chances of, of helping them out. Uh, and if there's an easy way for them to reach someone that can help them, Slack, uh, GitHub discussions, um, you know, whatever it may be, you have another chance of getting them back on board and getting them getting them to test the product. If, if you or the project, you can't, if you miss both of those, chances are very high that this user is going to move on and try a different open source project or maybe go and, you know, it's, figure out it's not even worth it and go and purchase something instead. Once you get more mature and you get more users online or companies using it, you're eventually gonna run into the questions of who do I pay to help me out with the support for this? A lot of enterprises are still not comfortable uh, with an open source model where, where you either fix things yourself uh, or, or you ask the community to help. They want someone that has a an SLA attached to it with you know some monetary penalties unless things get fixed within within that SLA. So we've had very good success engaging with vendors, having vendors offer uh, uh, commercial products based on on Argo, for example. Uh, so when when an enterprise comes and asks, uh, who who can I please help me find someone to that I can pay to help me support this? We have some vendors we can point to. If you don't have that, chances are you know they might have to move to something else because they have internal guidance restrictions that require them to have that that support. Uh, and another thing that's been very useful, both in terms of of growing the community as as well as being a good part of the community, is integrating with other projects. Uh, that you know, helps you tap into to other to domains and user bases of similar projects that that solve an uh, associated use case. And if your project can and is modular that Torina talked about earlier, the importance of, then you can, you can work with those other open source projects, integrate with them uh, and offer you know, a, a, an end, end to end solution by still using those building blocks and that let the users to seamlessly integrate these open source projects. And it also puts, you know, helps you keep that rigor of building it modular and, and open source. And all these together will help you get to those tens of thousands of SARS or, or user adoption. Uh, one thing we've also had good success with is taking advantage of the open source uh, maturity and graduation processes. And that goes uh, no matter which foundation you happen to, to uh, have your open source project part of, uh, I mean, there are multiple out there. Argo that you know, we have the most experience with uh, is part of the Cloud Native Foundation. They've been very supportive and it helped us a lot with things like marketing, where we as an end user uh, and other individual contributors might not have you know, the marketing muscle to, to market and brand an open source project. And our vendors are a little bit different. They usually have you know, much bigger marketing machines that they can utilize, but for, for an end user, uh, marketing something that's outside of our core core business is a little bit harder. So taking advantage of those webinars, uh, tweets, uh, and, and the other things that you know that CNCF or these foundations can offer have been very, very helpful. They also help introduce some rigor into the process, be the various various tags and working groups that you can go and ask for help, you can present to, do yearly reviews and make sure that you know, your, your releases are on are you know, following a release scheme that you know you, you're doing uh, doing regular releases uh, and you have just regular 
release and product building and development rigor, which is really important if you're going to build uh, you know, a, a project that people will, will trust. These foundations have also been around for a long time and they have some really good best practices for governance, uh, code of conduct and things like that, that they can help you. Uh, they have skeleton templates for you can use to uh, easily adopt them and make sure that you know, your project, project is you know, according to best practices in the community and within these various foundations and make sure that you, know, you don't run into an issue down the line if there's a disagreement within the maintainers. And then lastly, you know, these, these foundations uh, take pride in the maturity and graduation processes. So once you've gone through the process, you know, the, uh, the community can trust that whatever has gone through this process has been, been vetted. So there are security assessment and guidelines and procedures that they will help you with and go through uh, to make sure that you know your open source project is, is at least as secure as you know proprietary alternatives uh, or or options. So some key learnings from this talk are not to underestimate the time and effort necessary for community building. It takes, in our experience, one to two years to build a following. You have to commit to evangelism, which means invest in blogging, holding community meetings, attending conferences, to slowly spread the word, to build a user base, and to build credibility with the community. You also need to provide lots of user support, which means answering questions, contributing to forums, uh, doing timely bug fixes, and helping users on board to your technology. Otherwise, users will move on to another project if they don't feel adequately supported. And you may not get a lot of engagement at first, but keep trying and really commit. Um, and also leverage related communities. Find target groups in the same domain and see if you can provide integrations for those projects. Attend meetings and see if you can present. Um, you know, if you have common problems, then you can work to resolve them. So you can provide utility among the community and also uh, generate some good feelings. So uh, the last thing is that working in open source is very rewarding. Even though it is tough and you need to put in legwork, it feels great when it happens. It's amazing to meet and work with people around the world. And it's incredibly satisfying to see amazing organizations use your product to develop new things. So what's next in our journey, both on the our Intuit side as well as with the Argo project? So we've had a lot of success with Argo. Uh, we have a lot of quantifiable metrics in terms of you know, the successes we've had in terms of increasing developer productivity, cost savings. So management uh, at Intuit is really excited about you know, expanding and increasing the commitment to open source. So you know we're hoping here as we move forward this year and then in the years to come that you know we'll have more uh, innovations, more projects, and even more re resources that we can put into the open source, open source community. Uh, we're also looking and hoping to graduate Argo here soon uh, as part of the final step in the maturity process. Uh, we've, we've come a long way with Argo, uh, has some awesome adoption, has some really good projects within Argo and, and get to the last level of maturity within C CNCF would be a good testament uh, to all the hard work that all the engineers and contributors have put into this um, over the years. We're also looking at doing more cross project and uh, vendor collaboration and integrations here over the next uh, year or so. We have a number of vendors that we're already working with within the community. There are more vendors that are looking uh, at building solutions, products uh, on top of or with, with the Argo project. So we're really excited about you know, having more alternatives for the community uh, when they want to choose an, a commercial offering on this. Uh, we're also looking at using those Argo building blocks and integrating them with uh, more and other open source projects to make sure that you know, we can build better solutions together, build better communities together and be a really good uh, community player. So lastly, we just want to say thank you to all the amazing uh, users and companies are part of our community. It's been uh, awesome to work with everyone. We've had a lot of good feedback and experiences working with all these companies. It's been a lot of uh, beer, sweat, and tears, uh, 
uh, but we've had a really good ride so far. Looking forward to getting to that graduation and uh, go beyond that. So thanks to everyone uh, from these companies. If you are using Argo, thank you so much. If you're not, uh, we'll change that shortly. Yeah, thank you to everyone who has contributed to the Argo projects over these years. We really appreciate the time and effort you've put into our projects. Yeah, so thank you everyone. And thank you for attending this talk. Thanks everyone. We'll see you uh, in a live Q&A here shortly.